Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Michael Ayala. We are still waiting for the verdict in the Hollywood Obsession murder trial. Jurors deliberated seven and a half hours over two days. We're going to soon find out if they believe Garrett Pursehouse killed his former girlfriend, Amy Harwick. Was it intentional? Was it an emotional response to provocation? Those are all the things under consideration. My understanding is that the families and the attorneys are in the courtroom. They're just waiting for the defendant to arrive. And again, we'll take you there live as soon as things get going in the courtroom. They're still with us. Criminal defense attorneys Francis Johnson and David Bruno. And, and David, I'll start with you because when I look at the evidence in the case, I think one of the issues obviously is what was in the mind of the defendant. A big issue surrounding that for me was this syringe of nicotine. Now, it had some other chemicals in there. The defense kind of brought that up. But at the end of the day, it's not something you can pick up at the local store or just the average person might have in their pocket. So the prosecutors basically argued that this showed premeditation. He bought that, had to obtain that online somehow, he or wherever he obtained it, brought it to the house for the particular purpose of killing her. And I thought that was a pretty good argument. But the defense had a bit of a different approach. Let's take a listen to what the defense argued regarding that syringe. We have to assume that this was brought for some other purpose because it is not a weapon. If Mr. Pursehouse intended to kill Amy Harwick, wouldn't there be a lot of other efficient, meaningful ways to do it other than bringing a syringe? That syringe was intended for somebody else. We know that they wanted to argue that somebody else was him, but they weren't able to because he didn't take the stand. There was no evidence that he was suicidal. But your thoughts on the on this syringe, David, as evidence in this case? Yeah, as you made the point, it goes both ways. Yeah, it's, it's a critical piece of evidence for the state because it would show an intent to go and injure, hurt, or kill, but it wasn't used. It wasn't used. Now that argument typically works in a case where there's not a death. When there's some sort of attempted murder and, a, and the argument is made, well, if they wanted to intend the death, well, don't you think they could have or would have using the particular instrument? But he or she did die. He, she, he was able to complete the objective through another means. And that was a combination of blunt force trauma, potentially strangulation, and then over the rail, in falling, right? So I think it's a good argument and it cuts both ways. But I think the defense attorney kind of lost a little credibility uh, right there that it was meant for someone else, right? I mean, yeah, maybe suicidal, but who else, right? I mean, who else would it have been made for? There's a protective order, he's in the house, he shouldn't be in the house, and he's bringing that in the house. So I think that's where the prosecutor focused on, and I think that is the key to understanding what his mindset was when he entered the house. I agree, and that's what the defense had to attack. And I think the defense was hoping that the jury would understand the inference there, that he was under, and she said it a number of times, he was under such an emotional disturbance, so much so that he couldn't even form the intent. So I think she was hoping this jury would say, well, if it was there for someone else, the only other person there was him. So I think she was hoping that was that was really a bit of a Hail Mary, and we said that all along. Francis, you know, this, you know, in, in, in California, there's no felony murder, which would have been a slam dunk in this case. The burglary would have been the felony, and, and she died as a result of the commission of a felony. It would have been felony murder, bye-bye. But here you had to find some sort of intent, and there's also implied intent. And I want to read to you one of them, and I'm, I'm wondering why, why um, the jury struggled with this. He deliberately acted or with conscious disregard for human life, there's that. And also, the death was the natural and probable consequences to the dangers that he created. And I thought both of those fit this, one perhaps more than the other, but both of those fit as implied malice or implied intent. Do you agree? Uh, I agree with you. At the same time, that defense attorney had a job to do and her job was to disturb uh, that implication. And I think she did that in a number of ways. And one, she kept bringing up the past engagement and entanglement they had. And the fact that uh, this uh, chance to meeting, which he did not uh, engineer, was uh, serendipitous. They met at this adult 
uh, Gala triggered something in him that sent him on an emotional roller coaster. And I think that's the key here in terms of an implied uh, intent. But the specific intent that the California Penal Code 189 requires uh, to the laying in wait, which moves this to a first degree murder, uh, that's what she was trying to get at with the everything, including the, the kitchen sink defense, to try to see if she could knock one of those jurors off of this path of implied intent and the specific intent required for the first degree murder in California. Yeah, again, word from the courtroom right now is that everyone's just waiting for the jury to be brought in. Again, we're just seeing a seal still. As soon as we get a shot of the courtroom, we will take you there live. David Bruno um, going to the defense's argument. There was a lot of acrimony online regarding the arguments that perhaps this confrontation might have been somewhat brought about by the actions of the defendant, somewhat blaming, I mean, of the victim, blaming the victim a little bit. I thought the defense walked a very fine line there, that there was this rejection that causes the problems for the defendant painting him as a victim. I thought that could backfire. Yeah, especially when you're in the victim's home. I mean, that's the sanctity of the home. That's the safest place that we all go home. We expect to be safe in the home, right? And then the protective order. She feared. She needed protection. And then just to follow up on our last conversation, Michael, the fact that he wanted to kill himself, if we assume that fact for one second, that it was a lethal dose of nicotine so that he would commit suicide, that doesn't help the defendant either, because that's a typical situation of murder suicide. You finish the job and then you kill yourself. If that's the case, well then it's another argument for the prosecutor that the intention was to kill. But he didn't have that opportunity. It looks like from the evidence that it fell out during the struggle on the balcony. So with that being said, there's always two ways to look at these things. It goes both ways. It's gonna be interesting to see what the jury adopted as to what the evidence, the credible evidence that was presented to them. Absolutely, and Francis Johnson, finally, I think the one thing that might have caused some problems, and, and this is a sort of a fine line, is this idea that whether he actually picked her up and threw her, or in some fit of running away from him, or during a struggle, she fell over that banister and died that way. All right, my understanding is that the jury is now in the courtroom, so let's go out there to see what the verdict is. All right, so there you have it. Gareth Persas found guilty of the top charge, actually both top charges, guilty of murder in the first degree, the intent to kill Amy Harwick by lying in wait, and also the burglary, the first degree burglary charge as well. Um, let me bring you quickly our guest, criminal defense attorneys Francis Johnson, David Bruno. Francis, I'll start with you. Your reaction to the verdict? Uh, they believed the prosecutor's narrative that he concealed his uh, presence for the purpose of killing uh, this young lady. This community has suffered a loss. Family has suffered a loss that he waited and watched. He surprised her with an attack and he had the specific intent when he got there to kill her when she arrived. That's the verdict. That is the verdict. And, and the key to that verdict in finding that murder in the first degree, it means that he will be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, David Bruno. Yeah, absolutely. And I also want to applaud this jury. I mean, they, only, they almost went eight hours in their deliberation assessing the evidence because of the uh, absolute serious burden of proof that the government had and the presumption of innocence. And they did their job. They did their job. They looked at it all. And we have been talking about this. We were surprised. We thought it was coming back earlier. It's in the home. Bring the syringe in. The testimony of the roommate. The prior protective order. There was a lot of reasons to come back quick in this case. But they did not. They did their duty. And I applaud them. And I'll tell you what, when you're a defense attorney, sometimes you look for small victories. And I think the fact that they deliberated seven hours and 